Hello ladies and gentlemen and movie lovers of all kind and welcome back to the channel. As always, I am your host, Brett Murphy, and for today's video, it is going to be the very first episode in another brand new series on my channel called The Director's Chair. I know, what an original name, right? So as I said, this is a brand new series on my channel where in each new episode, I will be looking at a different specific director and analyzing various aspects of their career to determine what makes them stand out from the crowd. And for this very first episode, I have decided to focus on the one and only Paul W.S. Anderson, whom I have dubbed the king of big budget B-movies. So without further ado, let's hop right into things. So to start, what exactly is a B-movie? I have a few different definitions I wanted to go over here. The first definition that's a bit more reliable comes from definitions.net. And it reads, a B-movie is a low budget commercial motion picture that is not definitively an art house or pornographic film. In its original usage during the golden age of Hollywood, the term more precisely identified a film intended for distribution as the less publicized bottom half of a double feature. Although the US production of movies intended as second features largely ceased by the end of the 1950s, the term B movie continue to be used in the broader sense it maintains today. In this post golden age usage, there is ambiguity on both sides of the definition. On the one hand, many B movies display a high degree of craft and aesthetic ingenuity. On the other, the primary interest of many inexpensive exploitation films is purient. In some cases, both may be true. And a different, more accurate definition from the Urban Dictionary reads, a movie known for their low budget or possibly even their low grade of acting. Most of the time, B-movies are either sci-fi or horror, but are most of the time unintentionally funny. My definition is that B-movies are poorly acted, low budget, cheesy, schlocky, flicks with bad VFX and a relatively short runtime. But they are also extremely funny, most of the times unintentionally, and can be damn entertaining to watch if you're in the right mood. Most B-movies have become massive cult classics, and it really has become a genre of its very own. To the point that many filmmakers intentionally make B-movies. I mean, they intentionally make movies that are poorly acted, low budget, and just like so bad they're good. But I've also heard that most times, they're the most fun to be a part of. Because there's no worries about putting a big budget to waste, there's no worries about appeasing legions of fans, there's no worries about award seasons or anything else that the A movies have to worry about. I mean look at the Sharknado movies for instance, they are B movies through and through, but they are massive massive hits. You can't look me dead in the eye and tell me that the people making those movies and the people acting in them truly believe they are making cinema. But those movies are beloved by millions, and they are atrocious. So now, who is Paul W.S. Anderson? Born Paul William Scott Anderson on March 4th of 1965, in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, England, United Kingdom. He was the youngest student ever to graduate from the University of Warwick, with a Bachelor of Arts in Film and Literature. He began his professional career as a writer on the British crime drama comedy EICID. There he met a producer of the same age by the name of Jeremy Bolt, and together the two of them created Impact Pictures in 1992. Eventually they were able to secure enough money to fund Anderson's first film, Shopping, a graphically violent independent British film starring a then unknown Jude Law in his very first theatrically released role. However, the film took essentially forever to actually get to its theatrical release, as the British Board of Film Classification were not pleased in the slightest with the film's violent nature. Eventually though, the film was accepted to the Sundance Film Festival, where Anderson was first introduced to American audiences, which in turn kick-started his career. And now, speaking of Anderson's career, let's dive into his filmography. So once again, his very first film was released in 1994 and was titled Shopping. The film follows Billy and Joe, two joyriders who aim to leave their mark on a British city in the near future, with their ram raiding and violent behavior. Once again, like I just mentioned, this film took forever to actually get released, especially to British audiences, because the British Board of Film Classification thought it was far too violent. Because of the film's shoddy release, I wasn't able to find much information on how well it was received. All I know is that it has a 5.4 on IMDb, a 48% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, and apparently it only made $3,061 at the box office. However, it is because of this movie that Paul W.S. Anderson was offered his next project, 1995's Mortal Kombat. 
Based off of the popular video game series of the very same name, this movie loosely follows a combination of plot elements from the first two critically acclaimed games, where three unknown martial artists are summoned to an unknown island in order to compete in a tournament whose outcome will decide the fate of the world. Regardless, it currently has a 5.8 on IMDb, a 58 on Metacritic, a 48% critical score, and a 57% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. With the critic consensus reading, Despite an effective otherworldly atmosphere and appropriately cheesy visuals, Mortal Kombat suffers from its poorly constructed plot, laughable dialogue, and subpar acting. Despite all of that though, the budget was a small 18 million and managed to land a whopping 122 million at the worldwide box office. After this came Anderson's first shot at the sci-fi horror genre with 1997's Event Horizon. The movie follows a rescue crew who investigates a spaceship that disappeared into a black hole and has now mysteriously returned, with someone or something new on board. Despite the film starring Sam Neill not long after the massive success that was Jurassic Park, Lawrence Fishburne and the then relatively unknown Jason Isaacs, it wasn't enough to save this one. Nevertheless, Event Horizon scored a 6.7 on IMDb, a 35 on Metacritic, a 28% critical score, and a 61% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes with the critical consensus reading, Despite a strong opening that promises sci-fi thrills, Event Horizon quickly devolves into an exercise of style over substance whose flashy effects and gratuitous score failed to mask its over-reliance on horror cliches. The movie had a $60 million budget and only managed to make back $26 million at the worldwide box office. But despite it flopping at the box office and its poor critical reception, the movie has become a major cult classic hit since its release. You thought Event Horizon bombed? Wait till you get a load of this one. Just a short year after Event Horizon, Paul W.S. Anderson was back in theaters with the Kurt Russell starring Soldier, released in 1998. Soldier follows Kurt Russell as a soldier who trained from birth who has now been deemed obsolete and dumped on a waste planet where he is reluctantly taken in by a community of defenseless stranded wayfarers. Despite Russell's star power, no one seemed to care about this movie in the slightest. It currently sits at 6.1 on IMDb, it doesn't even have a Metacritic score, a puny 13% critical, and a 44% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes with the critical consensus reading, a boring genre film in a waste of a good set. Yikes. Like Event Horizon, this one had a $60 million budget, but it was only able to make $14 million at the worldwide box office. That was 1-4, not 4-0. After that, Anderson's next project was the TV movie, The Sight, which received a very meh reception as it currently sits at a 5.9 on IMDb. And it looked like the early success of Anderson's career was nothing more than a fluke. After two box office bombs and an underwhelming TV movie, it seemed like his career may have already been over. But then, Anderson managed to nab himself one more shot at the big leagues, and returned to what gave him his big break in the first place, adapting a major video game franchise. In 2002, the first Resident Evil film adaption released. The film took elements from the franchise, but also incorporated many of Anderson's very own ideas. The official plot summary states that a special military unit fights a powerful, out-of-control supercomputer and hundreds of scientists who have been mutated into flesh-eating creatures after a laboratory accident. The movie has a not-so-bad 6.7 on IMDb, but only a 33 on Metacritic, a 35% critic, and a 67% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, with the consensus reading, Like other video game adaptions, Resident Evil is loud, violent, formulaic, and cheesy. The movie only had a small $33 million budget, but managed to make $103 million at the worldwide box office. Little did Anderson know, he would later down the line be marrying the star of this film, Mila Jovovich. And he had just so happened to kickstart a brand new franchise that would go on to earn $1.2 billion at the worldwide box office. After that, Anderson was trusted with bringing together the highly anticipated and long tease crossover between two of sci-fi's greatest creatures in 2004's Alien vs. Predator. The film followed a group of archaeologists and scientists on a dig in Antarctica, only for them to find themselves caught in the middle of a long-waged war between xenomorphs and predators. The film currently sits at a 5.6 on IMDb, and it only managed to nab itself a 29 from critics. 
It also has a very rotten 21% critic reception and a 39% audience reception on Rotten Tomatoes. With the consensus reading, Gore without scares and cardboard cutout characters make this clash of monsters a dull sit. The film had a $60 million budget and managed to bring in $177 million at the box office. This one, just like Resident Evil, are very much so guilty pleasure flicks for me. I really do enjoy watching them and honestly I probably watch them at least once a year. They're just fun, dumb, big budget B movies that you can just enjoy at any time no matter what mood you're in. Now despite back to back box office successes, Anderson found himself back in the director's chair of another TV movie flop. Drift released in 2006, and it only has a 4.9 on IMDb with just 44 ratings. No poster, no plot summary, nothing. It wasn't until four years after Alien vs Predator that Anderson finally returned to theaters, with my personal favorite of his filmography, 2008's Death Race. The story follows ex-con Jensen Ames as he is forced by the warden of a notorious prison to compete in our post-industrial world's most popular sport, the Death Race. A car race in which inmates must brutalize and kill one another on the road to victory and freedom. Death Race has a 6.4 on IMDb and a 43 on Metacritic, with a 42% critic score and a 60% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, and the critical consensus reads, Mindless, violent, and lightning-paced, Death Race is little more than an empty action romp. This one wasn't quite the success Anderson was hoping for though, as it had a $45 million budget but only managed to make $76 million at the worldwide box office. Now this is the one Anderson movie that I will actually defend as a genuinely entertaining and good popcorn flick. Not guilty pleasure like any of his other movies that I moderately enjoy, I actually think this one's a good movie. Is the plot great? No. Is the dialogue great? Also no. Is the acting great? It's fine. But the race sequences are mindless gory fun and Jason Statham is just a charismatic guy no matter what he's in. Just two years later, Anderson was back with Resident Evil Afterlife. Yes, Anderson returned to the series that revitalized his career, once again starring his now wife, Mila Jovovich. This was the fourth film in the franchise, but only the second that Anderson directed. However, he had still written and produced the second and third entries in the franchise. This one follows Jovovich once again as Alice, as she joins a group of survivors living in a prison surrounded by the infected who all plan to escape together and try and relocate to a mysterious, supposedly unharmed safe haven known as Arcadia. This was where the franchise, and Anderson's career as a whole, began to take a turn for all style, no substance. As this one focused even less on the story and characters than the previous ones did, and put all of its focus into its slow-mo and 3D effects. The movie currently sits at a 5.8 on IMDb and has a 37 from Metacritic, with just a 22% critic and a 48% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes where the critical consensus reads, As dim-witted and lifeless as its undead antagonists, Resident Evil Afterlife is a wholly unnecessary addition to the franchise. This film, like many other of Anderson's, only had a $60 million budget but managed to make a... $300 million at the worldwide box office. Whoa! I mean, this one is probably my least favorite in the franchise because it's just so boring. Like, even the flashy visual stuff and the zombie killing is plain and dull in this one. But, like, good for him, honestly. Just one year later, Anderson was back in theaters in 2011 with The Three Musketeers. This one sticks out like a sore thumb in his career to me. It feels so out of place in his filmography. This film is just an updated, modern, very much so Paul W.S. Anderson version of Alexander Dumas' original story. The movie only has a 5.7 on IMDb with a 35 Metacritic score. It has a 26% critic and a 39% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes where the critical consensus reads, It plays admirably fast and loose with Alexander Dumas' classic tale, but in every other aspect, The Three Musketeers offers nothing to recommend, or to set it apart from the many other film adaptions. The film had a $75 million budget, making it Anderson's biggest project to date, but only managed to take in $132 million at the worldwide box office. And then 2012 rolled around and what's this? Another Resident Evil movie? Oh joy. This one at least had some interesting ideas and fun set pieces, even if it's likely the furthest gone from even the more outlandish iterations of the video game franchise. It follows Alice once again as she fights alongside a resistance movement to regain her freedom from an Umbrella Corporation testing facility. Sure, there are some more of the video game characters in here, but my word is the casting atrocious and the dialogue even worse. Again, 
all style, no substance. It has a 5.4 on IMDb and a 39 on Metacritic, with a 28% critic and a 51% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes where the critical consensus says, Resident Evil Retribution offers everything one might reasonably expect from the fifth installment in a heavily action-dependent franchise, which means very little beyond stylishly hollow CGI-enhanced set pieces. Check that, this one might actually be my least favorite. That's hard to tell at this point, they all kind of blend together. After that, Anderson took a two year break and came back in 2014 with Pompeii. And now we have a stylized version of a real historical event starring Jon Snow. And Anderson Pearl Harbored it, or titanic it, whatever you want to call it. Meaning he took a real historical event and made the main focus a love story with the actual historical stuff acting as background noise. The movie has a 5.5 on IMDb and only a 39 on Metacritic with a 28% critic and a 34% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, where once again the critical consensus reads, This big budget, sword and sandal adventure lacks the energy and storytelling heft to amount to more than a guilty pleasure. Which in a movie had a massive $100 million budget making this the highest budgeted film that Paul W.S. Anderson has ever directed, at least to date. But sadly for him, it only managed to make $117 million back. And in 2016, we had finally reached what is supposedly the end to Paul W.S. Anderson's version of the Resident Evil franchise, which he, let's be frank, really just turned into a vehicle to show off how badass his wife is. Nevertheless, this film sees Alice return to where it all began, Raccoon City and The Hive where the Umbrella Corp is gathering its forces for one final strike against the remaining survivors. It has some neat set pieces and some real treats for diehard fans, but the massive exposition dump at the end that are supposed to be big reveals falls so utterly flat it's embarrassing. It has a 5.5 on IMDb and a 49% on Metacritic, making it the highest rated critical film in the franchise. It has a 37% critical score and a 48% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, where the critical consensus states, Resident Evil The Final Chapter may prove mind-nubbingly chaotic for the unconverted, but for fans of the venerable franchise, it offers a fittingly kinetic conclusion to its violent post-apocalyptic saga. Which I think is also fairly fitting. This one also might be my least favorite in the franchise, okay? The, the last three of them are like, oh, really, really bad. But it is true that it does treat its diehard fans very well here. This movie was definitely made for them. Any newcomers aren't going to have any idea what's going on, but if you're a diehard fan following this franchise from the beginning, then this one will definitely be special for you. The film only had a $40 million budget, which is far below where the last two were, but managed to bring in $312 million, making it the highest grossing of the franchise. And now we have reached 2020 and Paul W.S. Anderson's most recently released flick, Monster World. They somehow trusted Anderson with another adaption of a massively popular and beloved video game series. And he made his wife the lead again. And they released it during a global pandemic. It's very loosely based on the game franchise, like very loosely based. It has monsters in it, which is something. It currently sits at a 5.3 on IMDb and has a 44 on Metacritic. A 49% critic score and a 71% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. Wow, well done, Paul. And the critic consensus states, Monster Hunter is mostly a mindless blur of action held together by the slenderest threads of dialogue and plot, and exactly what many viewers will be looking for. Which I suppose is fair. The budget was back up to Anderson's normal $60 million, but since they were stupid enough to release it during a global pandemic, it only made $18 million at the very few box offices that were open. And that is the end of Anderson's career right there. So I did the math, it kind of sucked, but we got there. Considering he only had 13 films, it really wasn't that bad. But here are all of Anderson's averages. His average IMDb score is a 5.8. His average Metacritic score is a 40. His average Rotten Tomatoes critic score is 31%. And his average Rotten Tomatoes audience score is a 51%. His average movie budget is 56 million. And his average movie worldwide box office haul is 136 million. So I think the title of the king of big budget B movies is fair. Almost every single one of Paul W.S. Anderson's films can be definitely classified as a B movie. Despite them not having very small budgets like most B movies would, I don't really think people use the term B movie in that sense anymore. I think what it really means now, like I said earlier, is that it has bad acting, check, poor dialogue, terrible writing, check and check, very thin plots, also check, very shoddy visuals, and an overall consensus of it's so bad it's actually kind of good. And don't get me wrong, I do definitely enjoy some of Anderson's filmography. Like I said, Death Race is my favorite because I actually think it's genuinely a half decent movie. But aside from that, I do enjoy the first Resident Evil film and I even enjoy ADP. 
But again, I enjoy those in a sort of so bad, they're kind of good, guilty pleasure sort of way. And I really do think that this concept can be applied to every single one of Anderson's films. But look, the dude makes money. I mean, look at the last three Resident Evil films. Their combined budget was what, like $160 million, but together they almost made a billion on their own. Like, they make bank. So yeah, the king of big budget B movies works for me. In the end, Anderson is a take him or leave him kind of director. I personally think his career and filmography are just fine. Some of his movies I genuinely enjoy, and some of them are guilty pleasures. And some of them I think are just downright awful. But aside from his directing gigs, for which he has gained a fairly sizable and very devoted following, he is also an established producer and writer. And outside of his film career, he has been happily married to the star of the majority of his films since 2010, Mila Jovovich, after meeting her on the set of the first Resident Evil movie. Together, the two of them have created a little family for themselves, having three children with their most recent only being born back in February of 2020. So, uh, happy birthday, I guess, little one. He's a director where it seems you either love him or hate him. And he certainly has his, uh, own style. But what really matters is the dude is having fun and living his best life. He's enjoyed a successful career, has a family, and a legion of fans, and has now been dubbed the king of big budget B movies. So that is all for today's video folks, be sure to let me know down in the comments if you agree or disagree with my opinions and thoughts on Paul W.S. Anderson's directing career. And feel free to let me know down in the comments who you'd like to see on the series next. If you enjoyed that video, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. If you'd like to see more content, consider subscribing to my channel and ringing that little bell icon. That way you can be notified about all of my latest uploads. And as always, stay safe. Thank you so much for watching. And that's a wrap. Hey you. Yeah you. If you made it this far, just know I appreciate you. And while you're here, consider hitting that subscribe button.